Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to St. Stephen United Methodist Church. We're glad you're here. A little bit chilly this morning, but it's nice to know that our new heater works. It's warmer than it was when I got here. Uh, so that is working. I want to welcome those of you watching on Facebook or YouTube. As always, we want you to feel a part of our congregation. If you will send us an email or a voicemail with your email address, we'll be more than happy to include you in our mailing list for a copy of our weekly bulletin so that you can sing along with us and speak along with us and read along with us. We want you to be able to participate in worship just as if you, as if you were here. Um, we'll remind everybody about our Must Ministries jar. Uh, it's back there on the table. If you wish to drop any spare change in the jar or make a contribution, Must would appreciate it. They are doing wonderful work feeding the hungry and have also recently opened a much larger shelter for the homeless and for those in need of shelter and this one actually includes 10 units designed for entire families so husband wife and children can be accommodated in those units it's a big undertaking and they need our support so thank you for your contributions everyone uh, <clears throat> today is the day for our official District Charge Conference. It will be held at 2 o'clock at Bethany UMC. And uh, you are all welcome to attend, especially if anybody wants to stand in for me so that I don't have to go. Um, I'm just kidding. Um, but wanted to make sure everybody knew that they were welcome to attend the Charge Conference where we conclude our reports and business reports for the year to the district. Um, let's see. Before I move any further, even though it was officially Friday, I believe, I do want to take a moment to honor our veterans. It's veterans Day this past Friday, and it is always appropriate to take a moment and give thanks and honor those who have sacrificed so much that we can love and worship in freedom as we do in this nation. Um, so if you would, just join me in, in prayer. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for those who have made the sacrifice, who have served our nation as veterans, those who have endured the hard work, the commitment, <clears throat> separation from family, and during certain times of our history, the horrors of war. We thank you for their courage, their willingness to serve. We ask that you bring comfort and healing an honor to the families of those who have made that sacrifice. And we ask that you help us as a nation to remain ever grateful for the freedom that they have bought for us with their toil, their sweat, and in some cases, their lives. We pray these things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Also this morning, we're going to welcome a couple of members into the congregation. Susan Lockaby and Kim Cook have officially done enough work cleaning the building that we're going to allow them to be members now. <laughs> so, if y'all would stand. Let those persons who are members of other communions or of other congregations in Christ's holy church and who now desire to enter into fellowship of this congregation 
present themselves to be received into the membership of St. Stephen United Methodist Church. Susan and Kim, will you be loyal to St. Stephen United Methodist Church and uphold it by your prayers, your presence, your gifts, and your service? Brothers and sisters, I commend to your love and care these persons whom we this day receive into the membership of this congregation. Do all in your power to increase their faith and confirm their hope and perfect them in love. We rejoice to recognize you as members of Christ's Holy Church and bid you welcome to this congregation of the United Methodist Church. With you, we renew our vows to uphold it by our prayers, our presence, our gifts, and our service. With God's help, we will so order our lives after the example of Christ that surrounded by steadfast love, you may be established in the faith and confirmed and strengthened in the way that leads to life eternal. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, bless, preserve, and keep you now and evermore. And we all said, Amen. Amen. Welcome to St. Stephen. And now we will proceed with our opening scripture.
before I move into our prayer time, let me go over the celebrations for the week. Birthdays, we have Linda Blankenship. <coughs> birthday. Anniversaries, we have Sean and Amanda Savage. Church membership, we have Sarah Jones with 68 years as a member of St. Stephen. Gloria Hughes with seven years. And Ronald Johnson with 55 years as members of St. Stephen. So thank you for your years of service. And we celebrate your loyalty and faithfulness to the church. In our prayer request this morning, we were asked to add the Brown family who lost a son this past week. We also want to be praying for Richard Hillman, the Jones family over the death of Chris, <coughs> Faye New, Jack Lamberson, Becky Sago, John Fuller, Gina Sue Smith, Francesca Asua, the Knowles family. We're going to continue praying for Sherry Clegg and her ankle, although we added her to the praise list this morning because she says her ankle is much better. But we're going to keep praying until it's 100%. On our long term prayer list, we have Anne Marie and Dave, Barbara Casey, Becky Newton, <coughs> Becky Sago. Beverly Savage, Carol Fuller, Camilla Munoz, Caroline, Graham Sykes, Gene Kibler, John Dickerson, John Reagan, Larry Cooper, Margaret Hughes, Margaret Simpson, Marlo Keith, Norris Jones, Phyllis, Sarah and Floyd Polk, Sybil Steffen, Victor, Victor Blackstone, Wendy Tedder, Willie Neal Kane. We need to continue to pray for those affected by violent crime throughout our nation and throughout our world. And those affected by war and violence anywhere in this world. And again, we want to pray for the families of those veterans who have sacrificed all for our freedom. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for all of your many blessings. It is only through the glory of your grace that we are free to gather and worship. We are free to pursue happiness and success in our lives. And it is only through your blessings that we have an understanding of what happiness and success truly are. We thank you for this church, for the opportunities for ministry and worship that it affords us. We ask you to continue to guide us as we make decisions about the business of our church. We ask that you continue to bless us, that we may gather here, worship as we see fit, praise your name, and seek greater faith. In our Savior, your Son, Jesus Christ. We hold up all of those who've been named who are in need of your healing, who are in need of your precious touch, who are in need of your comfort. We ask that you extend your mighty hand and heal those who have been named. We ask that you also extend that beyond the names that we have listed, that you would bring healing and 
comfort to all of those in our community who are in need. We ask your wisdom and guidance for our leaders, both in our church and in the secular world, as they seek to make decisions on our behalf, that their way of thinking and that their direction and their decisions may fall into line with your will and the things that are pleasing to you. Bless us as we sing praises to your name, Almighty God. And bless us as we give thanks for your precious Son who died and gave so much for us. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Join me now as we read our statement of faith. You will find it in your bulletin or on page 881 of the United Methodist Hymnal. Join me as we read the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sit at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
I think many of you already know, but the southeastern jurisdiction of the United Methodist Church, of which we are a part, uh, it's made up of a number of conferences in this region, held Episcopal elections, and our current bishop, Sue Hopper Johnson, will be leaving the first of the year to be the bishop in the Virginia conference, and newly elected Bishop Deese will be coming to take her place in the North Georgia Conference as our new bishop. And so I want to pray for wisdom and peace for them as they make these transitions and pray for God's wisdom and protection for them as they assume new roles of leadership in the United Methodist Church. So pray with me. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for providing leadership for our church. We thank you for the service and the hard work of our outgoing bishop, for the hope and promise our new incoming bishop, Bishop Deese. We praise you and ask that you lend them wisdom and guidance as they are chosen by you to lead and serve, that they may find the path forward for our church that is most pleasing to you. We pray for a peaceful and smooth transition for each of them as they assume new roles at the first of the coming year. And we pray these things in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay. So, we seem to be plowing through these seven letters, okay? This morning we're going to be reading from Revelation chapter 3, starting with verse 7. And it is the letter to the church in Philadelphia. And no, that has nothing to do with Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. To the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These are the words of him who is holy and true, who holds the key of David. What he opens, no one can shut. And what he shuts, no one can open. I know your deeds. See, I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. I know that you have little strength, yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. I will make those who are of the synagogue of Satan, who claim to be Jews, though they are not, but are liars. I will make them come and fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you since you have kept my command to endure patiently, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come on the whole world to test the inhabitants of the earth. I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown. The one who is victorious, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. Never again will they leave it. I will write on them the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which is coming down out of heaven from my God, and I will also write on them my new name. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. 
the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> so, I hope you've gotten something out of our study of the seven letters so far. I know I have learned a lot in researching for these sermons and digging into the meanings of these letters. And I feel like it's been a good experience, but it's also been heavy and ominous. Hearing Jesus directly criticize his own churches and the sins and shortcomings that he points out to them. Well, we're going to get a little bit of a break from that this morning. Because the Church of Philadelphia is not singled out for bad behavior or for sin or for unfaithfulness or for participating in the sins of the world. It is actually a church in victory, enduring and hanging on to the faith that they have been taught. Of course, there is sin involved in the story. But it's not on the part of the church. It comes from those who've been persecuting the church. One of the great lessons of the Christian church's history, and one that we don't talk much about here in the West, because it can be unpleasant, although it's actually a good thing, But this great lesson I'm talking of seems to be that when Christ is all that people have, those people tend to cling to Christ all the more. This can be seen in the early church in Judea, where the majority of Christians in Jerusalem and nearby were among the poorest people in the nation and fell under the persecution of the Jews and the Romans there in Jerusalem. And the history of the church shows this to be true. And many of those who first came to America to settle this continent came seeking religious freedom, and they too had been persecuted in the lands of their births. And quite often, came from the marginalized and from those who had no wealth or power in their nations. And they clung tightly to their faith because their faith was all that they had. And later, not so many years ago, The poor amongst the blacks in the South, in the United States, found that they had been given their freedom, but they'd been given very little else. And that there was very little opportunity for them to flourish and do well. And most of them had to begin as laborers or even sharecroppers farming someone else's land in order to make ends meet and feed themselves. But their faith was strong and they clung to their faith. And it was a priority in their lives. And I don't think it was a coincidence that the first successes of the Civil Rights Movement were led and engineered by a pastor. When Jesus is all we have, we cling to Jesus tightly. And that's what the people in the city of Philadelphia had done. First, 
first of the year 17 AD, there was a great earthquake in the region. And Philadelphia was in a part of Asia, or, or it's now a part of Turkey. They had a tremendous earthquake that totally leveled and destroyed many of the cities in that area. It didn't totally destroy Philadelphia. Philadelphia was spared the worst of that destruction. But for years afterwards, they were plagued by aftershocks and tremors from that earthquake, almost on a daily basis. And some people say that the stress of a catastrophe that strikes all at once has its horrors and it's hard to recover from. But when you have that constant stress of damage, maybe on a smaller scale, but on a much more enduring scale, it's hard to find any recovery at all because it seems like the catastrophe never ends. And that's what it was like for them for years in the city of Philadelphia. They had these aftershocks and tremors that were strong enough that they continued to damage the building to the point where most of the population moved out of the city and camped around it. And they would go back in and try to repair their homes or, or gather some of their belongings but these tremors were coming on a daily basis, so they never had any relief from the fear that these buildings were just going to collapse on top of them. You can imagine living in a, a state of constant fear and stress like that. In addition to these earthquakes and tremors, the church in Philadelphia was subject to persecution, like most of the Christian churches of that time. And we always think about the persecutions of the Christians being the fault of the Romans because art and history and literature has always portrayed them as being executed in the Colosseums in front of huge crowds, and, and those things did take place, and the Romans were certainly a huge part of that. What we don't talk about is that most of that persecution was originally instigated by the non-Christian Jews of those areas. You see, The Jewish nation, along with many of the countries that the Roman Empire had conquered, were given kind of a free pass. They could practice their own religion without interference from Rome and without having to adopt the Roman gods, as long as they obeyed the rules and kept the peace. They didn't want to share this freedom with these Christian upstarts. And so whenever there was a problem with Rome, they blamed it on the Christians. And they were constantly sending reports to Rome of how these Christian upstarts were causing problems in their communities and in their synagogues. And so, the physical persecution may have taken place at the hands of the Romans. It was more often than not began by their own brothers and sisters, by the Jews. So that's what is meant in this letter when it says, 
I will make those who are of the synagogue of Satan, who claim to be Jews, though they are not, but are liars. You see, God had made a covenant. In fact, he made that covenant over and over again with his people, with Abraham, with Moses, with Joseph, with Isaac, that their descendants would inherit the promised land and be the promised children of God and receive the glory of God. But time after time, they had violated their side of the covenant. And time after time, they had not kept the covenant. Until the day came when God, as his son Jesus, came to provide a new covenant in a new way for us to be reconciled. And they rejected it. So they were no longer God's chosen. Because as Jesus said, it's not your genetics, it's not your family line, it's what's in your mind and what's in your heart. That makes you one of God's children. In Romans chapter 9 verses 4 through 8 it says they are Israelites and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs and from their race according to the flesh is the Christ who is God over all, blessed forever. Amen. But it is not as though the word of God has failed, for not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel, and not all who are children of Abraham because they are his offspring, but through Isaac shall your offspring be named. This means that it is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of the promise who are counted as offspring. For no one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly, nor is circumcision outward and physical. But a Jew is one inwardly, and circumcision is a matter of the heart, by the spirit, not by the letter. His praise is not from man, but from God. See, Jesus told us in as many ways as he could before his crucifixion that it's what's in the mind and it's what's in the heart that counts. And so he continues to teach that lesson from his throne in heaven. It's not who your parents were, it's where your faith is. And according to this letter, the city of Philadelphia has remained faithful in the face of hardship and great persecution. And in our reading, he says, since you have kept my command to endure patiently, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come on the whole world to test the inhabitants of the earth. I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown. The one who is victorious, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. Never again will they leave it. I will write on them the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which is coming down out of heaven from my God. And I will also write on them my new name. So I would suggest to you that it is 
instead of it being in spite of their trials and suffering, that it is actually because of their trials and suffering that they remain faithful. Many times I've heard stories, in fact, I've told stories myself about how faith was lost because of some horrible thing that happened to someone. Well, I was a Christian, but I just can't believe in it anymore because he let my mother die or he let my father die or, or he, you know, did this to my family or he did that to my home or and that these horrible events shook their faith. But I believe that the opposite can be true as well. For those of us who truly understand and accept the blessings and the salvation of Christ, the trials that we face, the hardships that we endure, bring us closer to Christ rather than driving us further away. When we have nothing but Christ to hang on to, we hang on tightly. For Christians, this life can be full of joy and happiness. We are blessed in many, many ways. Christian life offers more peace of mind and contentment, contentment than any other possible path that we can choose. But no matter how many blessings we receive, life in this world also contains challenges and hardships. It is the nature of this corrupted world that we all face challenges and hardships. But I would suggest that without these challenges and hardships, we would have no basis for appreciation and gratitude for all of the blessings that God pours upon us. There's a song that used to get a little bit of radio play that some of you may have heard, some of you may have not have. It's a song called Blessings by a young woman named Laura Story. And one of the verses goes like this. It says, because what if your blessings come through raindrops? What if your healing comes through tears? What if a thousand sleepless nights are what it takes to know that you're near? What if the trials of this life are your mercies in disguise? I know a lot of you folks here at St. Stephen have seen many trials. Some of you are enduring hardship right now. But you've also received many blessings. Blessings that can only come from a life in Christ. So praise God. <coughs> Repent from sin. And share the good news so that those blessings will continue to fall on us. Amen? Amen.